Um, so hi everyone and uh, welcome to this first transition. And this week we welcome Julie Bautet, um, who is a PhD student in philosophy um, at UNSU and uh, ex -Marte. Um And um, yeah, her research combines both philosophical, biological, and architectural analysis um, to explore the relationship between architecture and ecology. Um, and she focuses on human and non-human factors that influence architectural design. Um, and she draws from various fields, environmental humanities, new materialism, feminist ethics. Very happy to um, have her. Yeah, Julie, you can. Uh, okay. Questions. So I'll share my screen. Yep. So wait just a minute. Okay. So I put it my. So thank you. I warmly thank Pauline Smith and uh, Louis Giacone for inviting me to the Just Sustainable Transition Seminars. Uh, whose issues I deeply share in my research work, uh, because uh, as you said, I, in my dissertation, I seek to renew the link between ecology and architecture. And uh, in this dissertation, I try to anchor my thinking in a field philosophy. So the stake is to conceptualize from and with the field to go beyond the theory practice dualism and to promote a connective and engaged way of thinking. So this practice of philosophy seems to me absolutely crucial at a time when thought is confronted with the current political and ecological crisis. So I carried out a field investigation in September 2021 and July 2022 in the city of Sraltubo. Sraltubo is a former Soviet research town in Georgia, which offers medical facilities, a bathhouse and sanatorium complex, so-called abundant since the fall of the Soviet Union. The city was also affected by the war in Abkhazia, a separatist region of the country. And in the early 90s, the sanatoriums hosted temporarily, but for 30 years, displaced population from Abkhazia. So between my two field investigations, the city was seen, uh, has seen sorry, the near total evacuation of the sanatoriums due to more or less, less effective investment projects. So we can already notice the multiple and complex histories and stories of Sraltubo and the multi-layered temporalities involved. So in three parts, this presentation aims to sketch out possible ways of holding together temporalities, architectures, and ecologies. So first, I will show how a material biography of a specific building proves to be a valuable heuristic tool for understanding the place. I will then expose how it leads me to highlight the ecologies of Sfaltubo through the practice of herborization, herborization consisting of collecting plants from a site and drying them. And I will finally defend the idea that such an ecology of ruins can be understood in terms of metamorphosis. So first, in the Kapvelian language, Sraltubo, so the name Sraltubo, comes from uh, Kuali, water, and Tubo, hot. So according to a founding legend, the miraculous water of Sraltubo would have been discovered by a shepherd. His food foot would have healed by touching a water puddle. So the legend aside, in the 12th century, Sraltubo water is already renowned for its beneficial properties, but it's only in 1882 that its therapeutic qualities are acknowledged by a Russian chemist. In the 19th century, many travelers come to relieve their arthritic pains, pains and in the 20th century, this therapeutic practices develop. So the city is then very, 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 very popular. In 1920, the government makes Haltubo an official resort and spreads a vacation culture around the idea of restorative health. In 1936, a development plan builds the Central Park, nine baths and 22 sanatoriums in a neoclassical style. 
Until the 70s, there is an increase in spa tourism, which leads to construction of um, 11 new sanatoriums in modernist, modernist style. And in the 80s, the activity peaks, the sanatoriums, uh, which are administrated by the Soviet Union, uh, attract a large number of visitors. And this is a real era of economic and cultural properties. And it's said to be the golden age of Saltubo, which has been able to value the power of water, they said, in a very prestigious way. However, the fall of the Soviet Union in uh, 1991 brings a major shock in the political and economic functioning of the country. In Khaltubo, guests quit coming and funding just stops, involving the closing of baths and sanatoriums. Moreover, during the following year, Akevia, this secessionist region, declare its independence and ethnic conflict break out and around uh, 200,000 people have to leave the region. And there are IDPs, uh, IDPs, which means internally displaced persons. And approximately 10,000 of them are welcomed in Sraltubo, in the facilities of the resort. So what you can see on the pictures. So the san sanatoriums are turned into collective centers and they become humanitarian shelters, but without uh, government resources. And that's why they soon turn out to be completely unsuitable and even very unhealthy. So the place goes from a therapeutic refu refuge to a humanitarian shelter of long-term emergency. So on the one hand, there is a spa tourism image. So the official, official advertisement and the restoration plans present Haltubo as the, I quote, biggest spa destination in Eastern Europe, or as the, I quote, reborn medical and wellness spa capital. And on the other hand, there is an image of ruins. So Haltubo appears on many blogs and YouTube channels which emphasize the post-apocalyptic aspect of the place. And dark tourism and ruin porn practices are deployed there. So this double Im image implies two forms of tourism, ruin tourism and resort tourism. And after socialism and post-socialism, uh, a capitalist and liberal layer is added to this history. Indeed, the government wants to restore the image of spa city and rebuild the tourist infrastructure. So many projects are outlined, but without much success. But in 2018, a revitalization project is relaunched with an announced reopening in 2024. The plans, projects, and announcements make almost no mention of IDPs, uh, take little account of the civil society and do not involve local authorities in the planning process. A vertical urbanism seems to be at work with an overhanging position, top-down decisions, and a lack of transparency. So the restoration project is based on a nostalgic narratives, narratives uh, with lyrical description of the, of the city's architectural potential and great pride of the local identity. This heritage vision looks at the, the architectural elements with a fixed gaze, as if projecting the present of recent history. So first, uh, the first page of the tourist office uh, brochure that you can see is a striking example. It says, feel immortality in Sraltubo, which is really funny. So the picture also is uh, interesting because it evokes the idea of a primitive, regenerative, timeless uh, water. And uh, it echoes, as for me, uh, it echoes architect Jeremy Till's argument that there is a real fear of time in architectural disciplines and profession. Architects are terrified of time to the point that time becomes the enemy of architecture. And Jeremy Till identifies a set of strategies put in place by architects to neut neutralize, deny, and cancel time. So the question is, in our context of Sraltubo, how to get out of the timeless vision provided by the heritage history, how to get out of what I call the uh, mortifying gaze. So in, cont in contrast to this uh, official discourse, the academic discourse tries another way by focusing on social history 
the history of IDPs, so internally displaced persons. This official, official uh, this sorry, academic discourse uh, introduces a critical discourse of official history urbanism, which considers uh, the space as empty and available for investor, investors. So from 2007, a national program for IDP's reset, resettlement is launched. In Sraltubo, the objective is to empty the sanatoriums by offering apartments which are often not only of poor quality, but also very far away in other, in other cities of the country. So this resettlement uh, policy is problematic because it deteriorates IDP's community networks. It, all, it is also inefficient because vacant sanatoriums are not renovated. But from October 2019, uh, a new dynamic of resettlement begins, but with a new deal. Buildings are constructed not, uh, not outside of Tzaltubo, but in Tzaltubo, in the south of the park. It's the image that you can see on the, on the screen. So finished in early 2022, they are given for free to IDPs. This means no cost and no distance housing. So during my second field in July 2022, the sanatoriums were massively, but not totally, evacuated. So the contrast with the first field was very, very sharp. So this academic history seeks to palliate the occultation of the displaced population's narratives because heritage tourism omits and excludes IDPs. Against the overhanging history of the heritage, the academic discourse offers a ref refuge, er refuge heritage, a uh, kind of a heritage from below. I wonder, however, if this academic history is enough to escape the mortifying gaze. I does, it does indeed provide a decentering by honoring the existence and the life of the displaced people, but does it also take seriously into account time in architecture? I rather suggest that it is necessary to leave the vocabulary of heritage and also uh, to leave a unique history that would replace another. The challenge is then not to elaborate another history, but to multiply histories. Temporality invites us to go from history to stories. And it is exactly what the SF writer Ursula Le Guin writes in her wonderful text, uh, The Career Bag Theory of Fiction. So against the, what she calls the killer story, uh, she suggests to tell life stories, that is to say asymmetric polyphonic stories without hero nor heroism concerned with the reality and the living. And therefore, I tried to collect uh, life stories of the place. So I carried out an, out an investigation into the crowd of the many sanatoriums, noting their singularities and the impressions they had on me. For, exa for example, bathhouse number eight looks like a random spaceship in the park, completely abandoned by human beings, but inhabited by dogs, mosquitoes, and brambles. The Gelati Sanatorium, which reminds me of a place of my childhood, is more isolated in the pines with its large arcades and is well maintained by the IDPs. The, the Hotel Sakarvelo, which means Georgia in Georgian, is like a wreck in the hill in modern style, very dilapidated and with a roof access. But it was the sanatorium Medea, which I choose to focus on. This choice is quite contingent. It surely depends on the magnificent appearance of the facade, also on the name Medea, which attracted my attention, on the impressive invasion of plants, both inside and outside the building, on the coincidence of the day, and maybe also on my mood. Medea was introduced to me one morning in September 2021 by a young Abkhazian of the second generation of IDPs. I then spent many hours a day in Medea, even if it was to get bored. And I want to say that the role of bored, boredom in a, is really decisive in, in the fieldwork. 
But anyway, I met the inhabitants, the policemen, the young people who hang out there. I also attended several shootings of rich Georgians because the big column of media are often used as a decor for shootings, wedding videos, or even Georgian rap clips. And I also got familiar with dogs, cows, wasps, mosquitoes, fleas, and the impressive vegetation of the place. I try to develop arts of noticing by mediating my attention, so through herbariums, sketches, or photography. The goal, of, the goal was to disengage from a dominant, all-encompassing point of view, which would see everything from nowhere. I tried to develop situated aesthetics by putting sensation at the center of my approach. So this situated aesthetics built from Arawes uh, situated knowledges emphasize the embodiment of material existence and uh, thus counter an abstract point of view. They assume the partiality of our perspectives on the world. They call for the notion of responsibility, that is to say the ability to answer for your point of view. So that is that um, no point of view, uh, whether political, aesthetic, or scientific, is not neutral. And finally, they invite to a critical practice, so to deconstruct and reconstruct the sensitivity. And I have a personal affinity for photography because of its sensitive anchoring in the world. It makes available precious epistemic benefits, benefits with the zoom, uh, the local length, uh, the focal length, sorry, uh, the aperture and the exposure speed. It consists of a moving and temporal practice that engages the responsibility of movements. And fi finally, it pl pluralizes perspectives and images. So thus, photography has allowed me to engage in an ecological approach of architecture. I tried to decenter my gaze, looking for other points of view. So the stake was to think from, with, and like media. So to think from media, it is to learn to look from elsewhere. It is to operate a decentering compared to the dominating, overhanging, and mortifying gaze of urban heritage. Then to think not from media, but with media, is to turn media into an investigation partner. Architecture is not only an object of knowledge, but also an active agent of the production of knowledge. To think with media is to establish a partial connection with her, with it or her. And finally, to think like media, it's to track her particular point of view, to consider her own sensitivity, because media is without eyes, ears, hands, without sensitive organs comparable to ours. So it's necessary for us to consider other modes of sensitivity. And for that, the narration uh, appears as an effective tool able to widen our epistemic repertoire. So this dialogical approach seeks to evacuate the biography and ideas of architects. The aim is to focus not on architects, but on the architecture itself. So how then to bring out the stories that shape the building? That's why I suggest to draw on uh, the bio biographical strings of media within a material biography. This material biography seeks to combine, to combine facts with story and to entangle temporalities, temporalities of the legend of media, that Corinthian, that is Georgian uh, witch, that po powerful and disturbing woman of the, of the mythology, also temporalities of the sanatorium stories built to house Soviet medical staff then turned into collective center and evacuated in recent year and temporalities of encounter stories. So this material biography could have taken the form of a of Wajdim Wawan novel, which is called Anima. I don't know if you, you know it, but this uh, detective novel has the singularity of changing narrators at every chapter, and these narrators being in fact animals that witness the different scenes. So this would have allowed me to explore the different points of view of media, the different agents at different scales. But this fictional novel on media will uh, surely never see the light of day, but we can imagine it. Nevertheless, I propose a material biography by other ways to show the ecologies at work and to get out, get out of the mortifying gaze. 
So in order to highlight the ecologies at work, I based the investigation on the practice of herborization and on herbariums. Plants thus open up the material, material biography. They actively participate in the transformations of media, reveal singular points of view on the building, and open the way to multiple narratives. Herbariums, that is collections of dried plants, allow deploying a philosophical and botanical analysis of contextual anchoring. I wish to show that this field philosophy, based, uh, based on a singular relationship uh, with plants, unfolds in three parts. Uh, yeah, three parts, three modalities. So it's collecting flora, then connecting matter, then fabulating evasion. And by drawing on both the epistemology of botany and the ecofeminist eco current, the stake here is to account for the ecological thinking inherent in herbariums. So first, collecting flora. So the first step is to collect flora, which allows me to enter into a dialogical project process with media. So by collecting, I accept and assume the companionship of plants. I become aware and attentive to the, to the living. I am concerned with details. And for this, I am inspired by naturalist descriptions. Indeed, natural history considers phenomena seriously, to the point that phenomena are very, very, very important to the development of the theory itself. So by stressing uh, this point, I try to show uh, that it's possible to overcome the, dualis the dualism opposing theory and phenomenon, but also uh, the dualism opposing um, theory and practice. And co indeed, collecting is also at the same time a questioning on the nature of the herbarium itself. By collecting, I ask myself what can be included, included uh, in uh, the herbarium. What is a herbarium if I had, a non, for example, a non-identified uh, plant, uh, a leaf that sticks out, or a feather? So um, what I want to say is that uh, there is a reflexive dimension in the collection itself. And in general, it all, uh, in general, we can say that practice is always theory from the start, as philosopher Sarah Ahmed points out. So she writes, theory itself is often assumed to be abstract. Something is more theoretical, the more abstract it is, the more it is abstracted from everyday life. To abstract is to drag away, detach, pull away, or divert. We might then have to drag theory back, to bring theory back to life. And the methodological stake of thinking with herbariums I propose is precisely to bring theory back to life. So herborization is also a situated practice. It involves a gendered and vulnerable, vulnerable body that selects some plants. And I felt this vulnerability during my fieldwork because of a kind of impression of a ambigu ambiguous suspicion to towards me due to my uh, un unusual presence, a single woman, my incomprehensible status, neither a tourist nor a resident, and my frivolous but strange herbariums. This configuration even led me to particularly unsafe situations. Can we say with ecofeminist glasses that the figure of the healer of, or the witch is hidden behind the figure of the gatherer? Can we say, that this non-institutional relationship to knowledge increases distress. And by the way, my investigation was carried out in the name of the witch media, and it's because of media that I cautiously envision my practice as a field witch philosophy. So in this framework, the situated uh, collecting consists in selecting physical specimen. It requires a work of discrimination and negotiation. Some species are overlooked. Some beings are difficult to consider as belonging to the herbariums. Some border objects like feather, mushrooms, lichens disturb the definitions. However, uh, we can say that the collecting demands to take into account other beings than human beings, mainly plants, by the way. And in this collecting, non-human agents participate in the elaboration of knowledge. 
herborization consists not only in collecting flora, but also in connecting matters. I want here to stress the materiality of herbariums, which lays out the collected plants after their drying. So the herbarium page setting is a relational setting. It establishes proximities. It allows for human and non-human connections between the herbalist and her predecessors, between the herbalist and the plants, between the pages and the herbs, between life and death between loving description and plant uprooting. So herbariums involve tinkering and patching up. Herbalists, herbalists make attach, attachments and detachments, and they tell stories and reform facts. So they implement a strange post-mortem care, even a trans-mortem care. Herbariums indeed pull the string of materialities and disturb the distinction between biotic and abiotic. What is alive and what is dead in the herbarium? What, uh, which matter is organic and which matter is not? I imagine here a herbarium of matters, not a herbarium of plants, a herbarium of, of matters in which not only plants would appear. I must therefore take into account the materiality of the specimens, but also of the object herbariums at such. It has its own vulnerable physicality. And I am thinking here of the sad misfortune, sad and funny misfortune of the British naturalist Wallace. I don't know if you know this naturalist, uh, British naturalist, so Wallace. So in uh, 1952, his entire collection was destroyed in the fire of the ship Helen. And I myself almost lost my dried leaf notebooks when a bottle of Georgian wine broke in my backpack. So mm -hmm. now the, stain, the stains of the, on the white pages reveal the fra fragile materiality of the object. Herbariums are living archives. By synecdoche, they are living archives because they contain organic elements. By metaphor also, they are living archives kept alive by the many commentaries of naturalists throughout history. And also literally, they are living archives because, because their materiality is evolving. It has a history. This materiality is today challenged by a digitization. However, a total, demater a total dematerialization is by no means uh, conceivable in natural practice. Herbariums are thus material objects, which have not only a conservation function, but also a connective function. They connect matters, sometimes in radical ways. And uh, the philosopher Anna-Catherine Alaboisière uses the term uh, transformative conservation to designate a set of conservation practices in which the individual species conserved are considered as plastic entities, but devoid of agency. And Laboisier said that uh, these practices appear as, uh, as forms of bio biopolitical interventions. So the aim here for us is to highlight the agency at work in the herbariums, but without obscuring the forms of power that result from them. So the herbarium's cosmology is trouble. Uh, and really trouble because uh, the herbariums are at grips with colonial science and with death and violence. But I think it is still possible to dream of other herbariums. So to imagine other herbariums, I would like to underline the communication issue that is behind herborization. Herbariums are meant to present and exhibit specimens to make them visible and to communicate information about these plants. Moreover, herborization is also based on a discursive practice. The herbariums invite discourses commenting on them. And it's therefore not a question of considering the herbarium simply as, as a stock of twigs, skins, or chromosomes, but of bringing out voices that read, uh, that read and link them. So the herbariums are a place of emergence of voices that tied being together. Herbariums seem, uh, herbariums seem overwhelmed by the stories and dreams of naturalists, herbalists, and non-humans. By making space 
for the sometimes invis invisible voices that inhabit them and by creating a trouble and unexpected connection, the herbariums move away from the idea of a mortifying archive. So the challenge here is uh, to fabulate such herbariums. But why, what is fabulate here? Uh, no, herbariums are in fact both empirical and speculative. They are engage, engage with fiction. And uh, a novel I like uh, shows it very clearly. Uh, it is uh, the novel Ici la Béringie, which means uh, here the Béringia, uh, so by Jérémy Brugidou. And this book uses the codes of fantasy, exploration story, and field notebooks. And it offers a narrative system based on a real and fictional maps of Beringia. Uh, it's the Bering Strait re region. And the novel intermingles three uh, voices. The, voices. the voice of Célézé, a gatherer who thousands years ago sees the rising waters arise, arise, uh, raising her world. Uh, the voice of Hushkins, which is uh, an American geologist who discovered traces of Beringia in the Cold War chaos. And finally, uh, the voice of Jeanne, an, ar an archaeologist from a close future, future, future sorry, who directs a permafrost excavation site in Beringia Park dedicated to the Pleistocene fauna. So issues of conservation biology and uh, re rewilding are involved in this novel through uh, the fictional park, which hosts uh, grain and spore archives, as well as extinct species uh, reintroduced uh, by cloning. So Beringia in this novel is in fact an opportunity to search for secrets, songs and dreams of living beings. It is a setting where several characters imagine other herbariums, which are not collections of corpse or, or carrion, which take uh, care of the proximities cre created by the living archives. And for example, the characters of the novel invent connected names of specimens. Uh, they write stories about their herbariums. They speculate about viral herbariums and they care about the dreams that the notebooks generate. So the challenge for them is to uh, mix poetry and fabulation with phylogenetic trees. So to get out of the fixed and fixing categories that label and mortify specimens and places, I imagine herbariums that rely, rely on fabulation. One starting point is to dream up plant names beyond uh, binomial nomenclatures of colonial science. The ecofeminist philosopher Val Plumwood calls this practice deep naming. It is about naming things in relation to their materiality and in dialogue with the earth. So making herbariums could consist in imagining speculative and relational taxonomies able to bring out stories. I made, for example, a herbarium in a room of Medea which I call the greenhouse because lots of plants are growing massively inside. And I realized that this herbarium was haunted by the figure of Artemis. Two species in particular were overrepresented. First, uh, Rajweed, uh, and the name in Latin is Ambrosia Artemisifolia, and annual mugwort, which is Artemisia annua. So one thing led to another, from dreams to legends, and I remembered the legend of Medea. And in mythology, Medea dresses up uh, as a priestess of Artemis to revenge Jason's father. So she deceives the, daughter, the daughters of the usurper uh, Pelias with a cauldron full of magic herbs. So my herbarium uh, uh, is also deeply affected by these stories and it links the sanatorium's history the taxonomy of the plants and the legends swarming in our imagination. So fabulating herbariums uh, make it possible to listen to the living beings and their dreams. They give an account of multiple temporalities, narratives and dreams. And so the dreams of uh, naturalists, dreams of healer and witches, dreams of dry specimens, dreams of herbariums. And the herbariums inaugurate an escape from the mortifying gaze of architecture. They give tool, tools to critique the nail boxes and the fixed filiations of the colonizers to critique a form of pinning ecology, 
which pins names and specimens, and they subject, suggest instead an ecology of evasions. Uh, and this field which philosophy offers, in short, a double opening, an opening of the analysis to human and non-human perspective, and an opening of biology and architecture to narratives, dreams, and imaginaries. So the empirical and speculative herbariums of matter enable to give an account of the moving of the moving materiality of media, of the sanatorium media, of her multiple singularities and her vivifying creativity. I would like to describe and formulate here the material ecologies of media with the notion of metamorphosis. So this terms, term refers to the idea of the matter circulation without particular distinction between living matter and inert matter. And the mat metamorphosis is a sign of uh, life's continuity and heterogeneity. What are metamorphoses telling us about the sanatoriums and about the notion of ruin? Can media's metamorphic cauldron enable us to think the temporal thickness of architecture? So the circulation of organic and inorganic matter matters leads to transformations. Medea is at the same time the same and different. She is always changing. The herbariums show uh, that show to what point non-human agent participates in the reconfiguration of the sanatorium. My herborist approach invites to underline the ar arrangement's evolution on the organic and inorganic metamorphosis of the building. These metamorphoses are linked to several types of transformation. So first, the, the transformation of agents, such as water, uh, non-human, and even non-organic agents. And second, the transformation of uses, such as the use of materials by humans over time in the sanatoriums. So these two types of transformations help to account for the ecological dynamics at stake. So first, in my investigation, the herbariums led me to water. Plants imply the presence of water and some species like ferns need a lot of humidity to grow. I was very impressed by the singular omnipresence of water in media. Water was sometimes explicitly present at the fountain, at the indoor and outdoor pools, other time implicitly present at the molds or at the ambient humidity which attracted mosquitoes, sometimes channeled in the pipes other, and other times uncontrolled with um, really big, big uh, leaks under the greenhouse and in the basements. So there is a paradoxical link uh, between water and architecture because water is both omnipresent and as possible hidden, and both necessary and dangerous. So media is also soaked by the ambivalence of water. Water appears indeed as a multiple and equivocal agent. It can be material water in construction, for example, in cement. It can be a therapy water with the balneotherapy that uses the power of water. It can be ornament water with the decorative pools and fountains, resource waters, water as it quenches the thirst of um, workers, employees, residents, IDPs, plants, or mosquitoes, disturber water as it seeps and deteriorates, indicator water as it signifies decay and insalubrity. So water is not a homogeneous agent. It is constantly transformed to generate multiple effects. So in a certain way, Medea sweats. The cloudy and troubled water is unable to stay still. It escapes the frames and the grids. So it's a stealthiness towards pinning, renewing the idea of an ecology of evasion. And uh, I want to say that in French, there is a play on words because the word leak and the word, uh, the word leak, sorry, and the word evasion and escape is, uh, it's, it's the same word, it's fit. Anyway, uh, such an ecology of fit, an ecology of evasions, challenges the marble identity of the sanatorium. So the ecology of ruins highlights uh, not only the multiple role of agents, uh, like the water, but also a second type of metamorphosis, uh, this time at the level of uses. 
So the idea of a herbarium of uh, matters encouraged me to collect not only plants, but also all kinds of material. And I thus questioned myself on their uh, function and their uses. Many of the plant, uh, many, many of the materials, materials collected, sorry, were very difficult to classify because uh, I, I collected uh, deteriorated materials, ordinary abandoned objects, garbage from occupations and squats, etc. So this attention to matters and their circulation led me to take into account the importance of waste, residues, detritus. And Jeremy Till underlines the inseparability of design and waste. He says that all architecture is only waste in transit. So the couple construction, demolition, or the couple uh, composition, decomposition seems inseparable to think about architecture. So medias materials littering the floor in unexpected state and places are a sign of the transformation of uses over time. In particular, the transformations actively carried out by the IDPs since their arrival at Media are striking. The IDPs moved into the luxurious looking sanatorium in the 90s and made changes, changes compared to uh, previous uses. They apparently destroyed the place. And in some rooms, for example, uh, the packet floor has been completely removed, leaving the, the floor bare, but it was to be used, used as firewood. So they took the packet floor to, to, use it, to use it as firewood. And to explain these behaviors and uses variation, the notion of a script can, uh, proves to be enlightening. So according to Madeleine Krish, the technical object all technical objects are always a negotiation between designers and users. She says that there is a script scenario, uh, which is uh, what the, designer have, the de designers have conceived as a more or less restrictive use. But uh, a tripartition is at stake, is at work between uh, first the technical design choices, second the user's representation, and third the actual use of the technical objects. There are always distortions compared to the script scenario. So users are never, never as docile as the designer would like. Other scripts are explored and towards the uh, technical framework. However, these alternative scripts are not a simple destruction, deterioration, or soiling. And for insta instance here, IDPs have done a lot of work to maintain media through a DIY, a real care is given to the building and new uses, new scripts are emerging. And this deviation of behavior permanently transforms the sanatorium. So media's appearance changes. It is, uh, yeah, it's this big. It is a Soviet palace, a humanitarian refuge, a post-apocalyptic hot hunted dream, a symbol of liberal investment, and the stake here is to think about the relation between this multiplicity of forms in terms of metamorphosis and not in terms of evolution, of progress, of vice versa, of decay or deterioration. The vocabulary of metamorphosis allows to be freed from any teleology which would hierarchize the various forms. And here, each form has an importance. And the philosopher Emmanuel Ecocha speaks in this respect of horizontal variation. He writes, we call metamorphosis this double obviousness. Any living being is in itself a plurality of forms simultaneously and successively present. But each of these forms does not exist in a truly autonomous separate way because it is defined in immediate continuity with an infinity of others, be others before and after it. Metamorphosis is both the force that allows any living thing to spread out simultaneously and successively over several forms, and the breath that enables the form to connect with each other, to pass one into the other. So, media metamorphic cauldron involves human and non-human overlaps. I see it as an invitation to better integrate ecologies and metabolism, metabolisms into architectural design. The aim would be here to think of buildings as polyphonic compositions involving heterogeneous matters. 
I wish to highlight the more than human fabrication of architecture. Media and any building, by the way, is not made once for all by a human being, but perpetually by meta metamorphic ecologies. It is an open process of making, well described by Araway's concept of sympoiesis, and she writes, sympoiesis is a simple word. It means, it means making with. Nothing makes itself, nothing is really autopoietic or self-organizing. Sympoiesis is a word proper to complex, dynamic, responsive, situated, historical systems. It is a word for worldling with in company. So with media, we are dealing with organic and inorganic sympoiesis, which invites us to go beyond living dead and animate inert dualisms. Anthropologist Tim Ingold suggests to think of an architectural making where the material is an agent to work with. Making means therefore to fit and engage ourselves into a world of active matters, into processes already underway. So just to, to finish this analysis, I want to say that such a metamorphic making implies uh, out of control trajectories and thus an overcoming of categories and notably of na nature culture and wild domestic dualisms. And precisely, there is a biological term that describes these out of control trajectories. It's the feral. So drawn from evolutionary ecology, feral describes a situation where a domestic species returns to the wild. But this notion does not describe a return of nature or a return to nature, because feral is what emerges at the limits of domestication. This term sometimes uh, takes, a, takes on a pejorative meaning when it is used to qualify species or identities that transgress, transgress the norm. And it can also qualify spaces, landscapes, and ecosystems that have been cultivated, but that are now developing beyond, beyond human control. And more generally, virality refers to the entanglements, assemblage, and processes that characterize the Anthropocene insofar as contemporary social, political, and environmental crises have led to a complexification of temporalities and specialities. Production systems have escaped indiv individual scales, challenges and needs have accelerated, and ecologies have been disrupted. So the feral dynamics of the Anthropocene are very well described uh, by the feral atlas. And in this uh, digital atlas, the authors define ferality as a situation in which an entity elevated and transformed by a human infrastructure project follows a traje trajectory beyond human control. So the metamorphosis of media rest on uncontrolled trajectories. They underline the uncertain futures of architectures and the unplanned and hardly institutionalizable material effects. Such feral metamorphoses adopt a particular regime of temporality, the regime of the unstable and latency, which stands in opposition to a deterministic planning way of thinking. So the rings appear, appear as an interesting pattern to give an account of this uncertain becoming. The material metamorphoses testify to the becoming ring, the becoming ring of architectures. But here, ring is not synonymous with abandoned place. Indeed, rings imply an active and inventive occupation of partially deserted spaces. But we only speak about abandonment in the case where people produce a resource. Abandonment is based on a dualism that opposes the resource to all the rest considered as waste or weed. When the res resource can no longer be produced or exploit exploited, the place is abandoned. So abandoned sites are abandoned only from the point of view of the resource production. And I seek to take here the ruins out of this capitalistic logic. However, we must be aware of a kind of aesthetic of precariousness because many research works uh, currently postulate a form of generalized precariousness of the world and invite us to study the life forms in the Anthropocene's rin. So the rin ruins come to occupy the center of the ecological questions. And the problem is that new aesthetic and ethic of precariousness is emerging which is uh, dangerously 
compatible with some neoliber neoliberal value, values, insofar as they promote an image of fluidity, spontaneity, resilience, keyword resilience, and malleability. So I, in my purpose was to, to show that material and metamorphic ecologies help to underline the link between time and architecture. These ecologies of ruins stage the becoming ruins of architecture and the unexpected ga gaps created by the living and by the, the matter. They also testify to the constitutive fragility of architectural projects designed by architects and urban, urban planners. And the perspective was to consider the temporal thickness inherent in architecture. I wanted to criticize a vision of planning, urbanism, and architecture that thinks of the living in terms of standardization or, or modeling, or even that thinks of neither the living nor, nor matter nor time. And on the contrary, media witnesses the material historicity, temporal strata, and metamorphic narratives. And these narratives are stories of vibrant matter, which never stop quivering beneath the beneath media's breath. And I thank you very much. I'm sorry, I was a bit long. <laughs> um, I have to. Do you hear me? Yeah. Now, yeah. Now I hear you. Little bit of time for questions. Just I can't hear anything. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna speak here. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um. So thank you again for this presentation. This is minutes for questions. Um, I want. Wait. Sorry, we, yeah, Pauline, we, we can't hear you. We, we understand only the beginning of the sentences. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to switch my video. Hear me better now? Does it change? Yeah. Um, can you actually hear me? Or just yeah. the yes. I think it's better. Um, so thank you for your presentation, Julie. We have just a couple questions, uh, and I'm going to open the floor online. I think you need to come in. Hello, Julie. Hello. So you can hear me. Uh, my name is uh, Peter. I uh, am very sorry to hear about the wine you lost. <laughs> you know, in Georgia, they keep it in clay uh, uh, pots under the um, terrain. So I wonder why didn't you carry it in those clay pots? No, this was a bit of a joke. I used to do my research there, and uh, I was very happy to see your wonderful photos and suggestions. I have just one suggestion with regards to your presentation, which I agree with Pauline was excellent. Really well done. Thank you. Um, I missed the link between your assessment of the current situation of the sanatoria and, uh, um, and the facilities there and your proposal for, uh, to, 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 to include the plants project, which is would since you suggested uh, to move from uh, official history to stories, uh, in what way would your story, your proposal, touch the hearts and minds of Georgian policymakers? Uh, and I think that's a tough cookie. Uh, however, it has to it has to correspond to the to their own aspirations and needs. So, where do you see the option for your project really to work, or would there be other alternatives that would work better? I know this is a bit challenging and may not be part of your uh, research, but I just wonder. What is the link that would convince the authorities that would need to finance this, this project uh, to make it happen? Thank you. So um, there is more aspects in your question. So thank you for the, these remarks. So uh, my my suggestion is, uh, is not the suggestion, the solution. It's uh, one 
possible, uh, possible one. And what I tried to show is that uh, by uh, analyzing uh, the official history, uh, I saw uh, a fear of time. And I was looking for uh, how to get out of this fear of time. And I was looking to other history and I looked to academic history, but I was still thinking, oh yeah, it's better to, to, to analyze Maybe it's another history to analyze the place, but we it's not really a solution to, to go outside of the fear of time, of the mortifying uh, gaze. So uh, I try to multiply uh, the gazes, multiply the perspectives, and it leads it led me to to the to 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 the living beings. And first I I I tried to, but it's contingent. I tried to make herbariums, but it's not uh, the solution of the of the well, the solution of the problem. It's one solution, at least uh, I uh, I tried to show. But maybe I didn't get your point with the with the because you you talk about Georgian policy and how it can convince convince them. But on this point, maybe I can say that um, what I want to say is more like an invitation to take care about the, the thickness of the places and uh, to, to pay attention to the fact that spaces is not just are not just available spaces where you can fight when you can do your projects. And it's an invita invitation to look at um, the more than human, or even just humans, but the several perspectives at play at at work in the land. Did I answer your question or not really? Thank you. Yes. And if anybody wants to complete what I said, it's a research in progress. So. <laughs> Do you hear us? Really? Yeah. I have just one quick question. I was thinking, um, the sanatoriums in general and media in particular, are they owned by any entity? Is it owned? Is it public? Is it private? Just yeah, so uh, I, I didn't have time to <laughs> explain everything, but yeah, they are owned by, uh, so at the beginning, they were uh, uh, the, the property of the state, of the Georgian state, but then there was a private, uh, private, um, companionship private firm who uh, who uh, which uh, bought some sanatoriums and right now more and more uh, georgian oligarch are buying the sanatoriums and right now the so now they moved all the the idp uh, outside and one oligarch is try, trying to buy all the sanatoriums to make this new spa capital but i don't know when it will be effective but it's a Georgian oligarch, which is buying everything. But it was a state property. When it was collective centers, it was a state property. Um, you said something, Pauline? Or... Um, we're still we're already over time. I'm gonna ask one quick question before we. I was curious, um, like, curious about the relationship, the uh, the internally displaced people who can you hear? Not really. <laughs> Not really. Am I, am I the only one? Hugo, can you hear or? No, no, it's the same. I think that where Loic was was a little better. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry, it's you can be better now. Yeah, try. Um, okay, um, I'm curious about the relationship. No. Okay. Um, sorry. Because we, we hear the begin beginning, but then it's silence. I guess I don't talk loud enough. I'll try and repeat if I can. Um, I'm curious about the relationship between in the sanatorium, like in the sanatorium, Kevin G. The, the sound, it's, it's really the, the sound is impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, repeat. 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 Do you hear me? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Much better. Yes, so you were asking 
efficient shift between the uh, internet display keyboard. Plus Kevin Jean, I think they are the same, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like yeah. It's so weird that we can't hear her. It's incredible. We can <laughs> we can we can hear one, one of them and the other is impossible. It's, I don't know. Sorry, I think yeah, this is a very gendered mic, I think. Um <laughs> she's wondering if uh, the um, what's the relationship of the internet space before with the natural world and mm -mm. Okay, so the relationship between IDPs and environment in general yeah so it's funny because yeah so the the ecology i mean the yeah environments and the sensitivity to the ecological crisis in saltubo it's zero like there is detritus everywhere uh, they yeah they don't care and i can understand about the the climate change or anything like that like that but uh, I spent, I, I, I told you, I spent lots of time in media and uh, especially with uh, this uh, young Abkhazian, uh, which became a friend of mine. His, his name is Papuna. Uh, and uh, I, by talking with him, I realized that he had um, a big knowledge of uh, the species and a big knowledge also uh, animal and uh, uh, plants species he knew a lot and he was able to tell me ah oh, look it's a it's a, a small papaya tree <laughs> because lots of people are just uh putting uh, all the papaya in the middle of the of the of the place so there is papaya and uh, he has he had uh, really an attention to uh to uh yeah singular species singular places and by the way he was growing weeds behind media so he really loved this place. <laughs> but it's very funny because it was inside uh, an ecological attention, a general one, even if it was an interested uh, ecological attention. Yeah, and he was a good, good example of the of the relationship between IDPs and and the natural world, I would say. I think we have to... Yeah, we have to. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Julie, for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. I'm, I'm very glad that uh, okay, um, I received the link to some researchers. Ah, nice. If you know him, he's working a lot mm -hmm. on Alexandre Monin. Ah, no, I don't know him. Working on the concept of negative commands. So ah, oui, oui. Yes. Really like the, um, I, he's one of the authors of uh, uh, this book, this new book. Yeah, yeah, I read it. He will, he will be very interested in your presentation. That's it. Thank you all for coming. And see you next week. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye. bye.